What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. We are going to be talking about the Belt and Road Initiative. This is something that is kind of pushing China up as a major geopolitical economic force in the world. And there's not too much conversation that's going on about it for some reason right now, but it's basically the most important economic advance of the 21st century. So what the hell is the Belt and Road Initiative and why is it so important? All right. Well, in order to really kind of understand this, I am going to pull up this really awesome graphic that we have. And the, the graphic is going to show you kind of what China's doing with the land in the Eastern Hemisphere and where they're uh, moving the goods and the economics that are going on within that area. And so this includes China moving goods through Australia and through the Indonesian area and through Southeast Asia and through India and through Asia and through the Middle East and through Africa and through Europe. So it's basically the whole Eastern Hemisphere is about to be economically saturated with China's infrastructure, roads, bridges, boats, uh, the sea, the maritime route, the uh, the education systems, the pretty much everything is going to be crazily improved by China. And we're going to break down exactly how that all works and what it's all going to look like here. And so let's start by saying that, you know, as you take a look at this doc that I made, I just want to show you guys that, you know, all of these things that I listed about real estate, the power grid, iron and steel materials for railways, highways, infrastructure, etc. This is going to cover 68 countries, including 65% of the world's population and 40% of the total GDP, which is just absolutely nuts. 68 countries, 65% of the world's population and 40% of the GDP. We'll touch on this again. So China's government's calling this the initiative, a bid to enhance regional connectivity and embrace a brighter future, which is, yeah, it's what they're calling it. And others like the US see it as a push by China to take a larger role in global affairs with the China Center Trading Network. And this initiative was unveiled by uh, Xi Jinping, uh, and that was in 2013, and that's the People's Republic of China president. And so, as I listed, you know, infrastructure investment, railway, highway, you know, we're repeating a couple of these things here because of the sheer importance of it. Now, I want to jump to this video. Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you just real quick that. <coughs> On the map that you see here on the video that we have, but it's also on Google Earth, you know, China is right here and they're kind of centrally located at the Eastern Hemisphere, all access to Indonesia and, and Australia. And then they're going to go through India and the Asian area and to get to Africa and the Middle East and also Europe as well through this area, through Russia. They've negotiated partnerships with a lot of places. So we're gonna be talking about this Pakistan corridor right here, which is very interesting. Yeah, I was just, oh, I was just showing. Oh, and the mouse moving, but yeah. You can see the mouse moving, it's hard to see it, but um, just that, that, uh, that Pakistan uh, corridor as well. But um, all right, let's play the video and let's elaborate a bit more on exactly what we're talking about. And we'll pause throughout and we'll mention things. There's a new highway in Pakistan and a new rail terminal in Kazakhstan. And shout out to Vox for making this video. A seaport in Sri Lanka recently opened as well as this bridge in rural Laos. What's interesting is that they're all part of one country's project that spans three continents and touches over 60% of the world's population. If you connect the dots, it's not hard to see which country that is. This is China's Belt and Road Initiative, all the most right. ambitious and infrastructure project in modern pause. history that's designed to reroute global... Ronnie, pause. Oh, okay, sweet. So, if you... Ah, we lost where we were at. Um, it's all good. Yeah, yeah, it's probably like 20 seconds in or so. It's with all the red dots. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, right there. A uh, little bit back. Right. Yeah, right there. So this kind of gives you an idea of how the networks are going to be interconnected. So I'll show you here with this orange highlighter. 
So, uh, so China is going to have a major access route through Southeast Asia and into Indonesia, and they're going to be able to launch through the maritime route down to Africa. This is called the Pakistan Economic Corridor, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Um, this is a big deal because it basically cuts the UAE. It, well, first of all, it gives China access to um, what is known as uh, uh, Western waters for China. China doesn't have any Western water, so this gives them access to Western water. Um, that uh, also gives them access to, there's oil here between Iran and Pakistan that they're finding right now. Um, it cuts UAE, the United Arab Emirates, out of the equation a little bit, and they're a little upset about that. We can talk about that more later. And then they're hopefully going to come up here through the Suez Canal and then up into Europe as well. Um, and so this is a very intense uh, um, thing that they're up to. Okay, go ahead and play again. And it's how China plans to become the world's next superpower. And you heard them say China next world superpower. It's Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Yeah, that's right. It's 2013, yep, that's right. and Chinese President Xi Jinping is giving a speech in Kazakhstan, where he mentions the ancient Silk Road, a network of trade routes that spread goods, ideas, and culture across Europe, the Middle East, and China as far back as 200 BC. He then says, yes, we should about take 2, an innovative approach so and jointly build an economic belt along the Silk Road. A month later, Xi is in Indonesia. Then two sides should work together to build up a new maritime road in the 21st century. These no, it's cool. two phrases were the first mentions of Xi's legacy project, the multi-trillion dollar Belt and Let's Road Initiative, or BRI. So what you what you remember? There's two of these. We have a we have an economic belt that's happening on land, and then we have a maritime Silk Road that's happening on water. Four to eight trillion dollars, a very very low ball estimate on what this is going to cost. Extremely low ball estimate. This is going to cost way more money than four to eight trillion dollars. Um, this is the largest infrastructure project that the world has ever ever went and undergone. So this is going to cost way more than that. So just, um, but the countries, interestingly enough, are lining up to take the bid from China because they really want Chinese 15 billion, 25 billion dollars to stimulate their economies because um, areas like, uh, like in, in Pakistan, Gwadar, Gwadar is the city in the southern part of Pakistan, they're taking on tons of money to build basically a new beautiful city in a, in a desert area right on the water. And so anyway, it's stimulating their economies in the long run and it's a very worthwhile investment for them to take on China. But China's also owning a lot of the ports along the way and they're not sharing it equally and stuff. So this is very interesting to think about as well. Go ahead and play. Hi, they're also the two components of the plan. There's an overland economic belt of six corridors that serve as new routes to get goods in and out of China. Like this railroad connecting China, China to China London. Pakistan and these right gas pipelines from the Caspian Sea and to China. Gas and a high-speed train Caspian network in Southeast sea, Asia. Loaded with natural then gas. there's the Maritime Silk Road, a chain of seaports stretching from the South China Sea to Africa oil. that also directs trade to and from China. The BRI also includes oil refineries, industrial parks, power plants, mines, and fiber optic networks, all designed to make it easier for the world to trade with China. So far, over 60 countries have reportedly signed agreements for these projects. Look at this. And the list is growing because China promotes it as a win-win for everyone. Take, for example, the BRI's flagship project, Pakistan. Like many countries in Central and South Asia, Pakistan has a stagnant economy and a corruption problem. It wasn't a popular place for foreign investment. Now they're talking about the China-Pakistan China economic came. corridor, CPC. In 2001, China offered to build a Gwadar. brand new port in the small fishing town of Gwadar. By 2018, the port, as well as a highway and railway networks, became a $62 billion corridor within the BRI. It's where the economic belt meets the maritime Silk Road. And it okay, seemed to benefit both countries. Thank you. So, ah. Oh. Uh, sorry. Uh, I see. I, I, we're learning. We're learning. That's good. It's good. Everyone, stay with us. This we're we're about to be crushing it soon. Like we're already we're doing okay now. We're gonna be crushing it once we figure this out. Yeah, that's pretty good, Ron. Right, right there was pretty good. Go back a little bit more, a little bit more. Almost that ah, perfect. All right. So 
All right, so now you see here, this is the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC. Now, I'm gonna take, the, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna dive you into, um, um, into what I have on my computer right now, okay? So stay with me here. We switched it over to my computer now, Ron? All right. Okay, so this is kind of, this is this port city of Gwadar, okay? And as you see here, it's, um, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal for China to have this access um, from China to this port city. Now, what else is interesting about this is that, um, I wanna show you on my notes here, is that um, the reason why, and the uh, reason why it says O-B-O-R right here is it's also known as One Belt, One Road, um, but it's more commonly now referred to as um, the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. So China Pakistan Economic Corridor is a significant artery, CPEC. So um, this is a five to 10 year investment period. It's significant for port construction, storage facilities, energy projects, urban hub, etc. cetera. Um, UAE wanted to be a major hub. Um, they still are, but apparently there's also oil in Pakistan to Iran as well. Now I wanna explain why this is really interesting. This is a surplus recycling mechanism, which basically means that you divert excess production from economic centers towards larger markets um, in the near periphery of these hubs. So a really good example is at the end of 1945, after World War II, Germany and Japan were the two hubs designated by American economic architects to be this uh, surplus recycling mechanism. So the United States would throw all of the excess production to Germany and um, which would then, Germany would uh, further uh, pass that down to the rest of its European constituents and Japan um, as well. So um, the three elements to SRM, which again, surplus recycling mechanism is industrial output, labor and financial capital. So um, industrial output, a really good example of this is how Chinese steel mills currently produce excess output that cannot be locally absorbed by at a profitable level. So at the contrast, the steel requirements of Pakistan are high and its own steel mills have faced difficulties for decades. So again, this is just a very common thing here. China will produce a lot of steel and then rather than Pakistan having to go and make massive amounts of steel, they can, China can just be that surplus um, for Pakistan and just pass that down to Pakistan and then Pakistan can build up a massive um, economic uh, project there and, and uh, make that better. So I don't want to spend a tremendous amount of time on this, but I just want to explain that Imran Khan is the current Prime Minister of Pakistan. And most people don't know this, but um, the Pakistani uh, population is huge. It's 200 million people, which is massive. Um, nearly the fifth largest in the world with an underdeveloped economic structure economy is only the 27th largest and so you know we saw a statistic about the gdp being very low um this is from uh just last year in 2017 so um now what's really interesting is that it gives china access to the arabian sea as we as we saw here and then um pakistan was known as another uh source of of lots of economic prosperity in the past as well so this is this is again so now let's we'll you know we'll go back to the video again just rem remember the earth is a very small place and the whole eastern hemisphere is being gobbled right now by china in terms of its Bro. ability to just and it seemed to benefit both countries it's all pakistan good. saw its highest that actually yeah go ahead and play it <laughs> it's all good we're learning we're growing billion dollar making it work within the bri it's where the economic belt meets right, the maritime the Silk Road. Me too. And it seemed to benefit both countries. Pakistan saw its highest GDP growth in eight years and forged a tight relationship with a major world power. China, on the other hand, secured a new alternative route for goods, see, especially see now, oil pause and real gas quick. from the Middle East. This part's really important as well. You gotta remember that the Middle East is a massive oil hub. And now China can receive oil from the Middle East through the Arabian Sea. And this is a huge deal. It's okay, learning and growing, learning and growing. Just fast forward us there quick. Um, wait, I think we're back a bit, aren't we? Or no? Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah, go back a bit. 
Yeah, go back a little. Yeah, it's right here, perfect. So just remember the fact that oil is being moved um, like that across uh, now through to China, through the Middle East in the, in the waterway, and then also from the Caspian as well. So this is very interesting. Go ahead and play. Especially oil and gas from the Middle East. Through projects like these, it also found a way to boost its economy. Chinese construction companies that had fewer opportunities within their own country saw a huge boost from BRI contracts. BRI Seven construction out of the 10 biggest contracts. construction firms in the world are now Chinese. Top 10 global what tips the balance in China's favor even Chinese. more is a requirement that it be involved in building these projects. Chinese workers in Pakistan, are migrating for example, out to do Chinese these workers tasks. have directly built projects like this highway here, and a Chinese firm has worked with locals on a railway here in Serbia. China's involvement is one of its very few demands, and that's set these deals apart so far. See, typically, to get investment from the West, countries have to meet strict ethical standards. But China's offered billions of dollars, mostly in loans, with far fewer conditions. So it's no surprise the BRI has been a big hit with the less democratic countries in the region. China has signed agreements with authoritarian governments, okay, pause. military regimes. This is, this is quite interesting as well as that, um, you know, maybe this can become something that digs us out of more um, autocratic militaristic um, regimes because there are definitely some players across the world that do take their power to levels of killing people that disagree with them and things like that, which is kind of crazy. And so we just got to basically um, just make sure that I think it's important that if China works with people across the world that have had histories of, 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 of malevolence, that it's, it's important to, to, um, to work together in that sense to make sure that the relationships are also benevolent. And the United States needs to do their fair share as well, because we've done our own share of um, malevolent things as well, and other people in the world have been watching us. So, all right, let's play again. And some of the most corrupt countries in the world. It's even affiliated with Afghanistan, Ukraine, Yemen, and Iraq, all currently splintered by conflict. Because of China's willingness to loan money to unreliable countries, many experts have called the BRI a risky plan. Eventually, these countries will have to pay China back, but corruption and conflict make that payback unlikely. They don't have a to recent pay report back found China that many of the countries the indebted to China are very we'll vulnerable, in including eight that are at high risk of being unable to pay. So why does China keep lending? Because there's more to the BRI than just economics. In Sri Lanka, China loaned about $1.5 billion for a new deep water port. It was a key stop on the Maritime Silk Road. By 2017, it was clear Sri Lanka couldn't pay back the loan. So instead, they gave China control of the port as part of a 99-year lease. 99 China also controls deal. the strategic so port in Pakistan, port. where it has a 40-year lease. Pakistan, it's pushing for a, a similar agreement in Myanmar, one. and it just opened an actual Chinese naval base in Djibouti. These are all signs of what's been called the String of Pearls theory. It predicts that China is trying to establish a string of naval bases in the Indian Ocean that will allow it to station ships Ready? and guard shipping routes and that pause. move through the... So this is also a big deal. This is kind of... China's had some interesting bouts here in the South China Sea um, where they've really wanted to take over a bunch of the, a bunch of the land there and um, make it so that they own the trade routes there, whereas this is international waters, it's supposed to be shared in many um, ways and it's not being. Um, and this is a very, um, it's, 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 it's very complicated to understand, but if one country controls that area of water, it basically controls the goods of like four billion people. So four billion people is a lot of people receiving goods um, so just you know food for thought that's over half the population um, which is why they're very interested in, in doing this but it's also potentially a major you know economic benefit in a potentially benign way so it doesn't necessarily have to be you know malevolent control but hopefully they're you know good player in the sense but they have the economic money to do so all right go ahead and play around region thank you so while china's not getting its money back it's still achieving some very important strategic goals. China's growing influence challenges the status of the U.S., which has been the world's lone superpower for the last several decades. But isolation is trending in the U.S., meaning that they are investing less and therefore losing influence around the world. All right, give the it a BRI quick pause. Is China's 
So um, I, I'm pretty sure we're at the end of the video, right? Um, pretty close. Uh, 24 seconds. Yeah, yeah. So what's really important to notice in this final part of the video is that um, you got to remember that nationalism and political gridlock are kind of holding the United States back, that political gridlock doesn't exist in the People's Republic of China. It's a top-down, we make a decision, you go with it. And really, at times, that's not that bad. If we had a sort of agenda here that was like, we're going to improve, we're going to make a, a new transit belt that makes it easier to ship goods between North America and South America. And you don't get a choice with your taxpayer dollars, and we're making it really really amazing technology. We're working with the private sector of, of, of all these different massive transit companies that are really smart and really good and it's going to be sustainable and uh, alternative energy. What would you do? Really, at that point, would you be mad? No, you wouldn't. You would know that the government is doing something in the benefit and the private industry and they're working together, which is what goes on in China. And that they're making a decision to create a belt down to South America that makes trading much easier between the two countries. Speaking of which, there also would need to be a belt down here between Africa and South America and between Europe and America. And we have the partnership between um, the North Atlantic trade as well as between the Trans-Pacific trade on this end it's to China and the Pacific nations. Now, just remember that this is a small planet. This is geopolitics. This is geopolitical leadership. If we're trapped in political gridlock, if we're trapped in nationalism, we are not going to be able to sustainably progress geopolitically over time. We gotta figure it out. Where are we gonna huddle in this, in this cave and make uh, artificial general intelligence and hope that it does something that, can, that all of a sudden other countries in the world are gonna wanna buy our AGI and our genetic engineering and all these new tools, brain computer interfaces, and that we're gonna make money on that and continue spreading democracy through that. We gotta figure out what's the best political and economic strategy geopolitically here, and it's probably not to turtle up for extended periods of time, and meanwhile, the whole Eastern Hemisphere is now has seeds planted um, uh, like who's, who are they going to buy from? Are they going to buy from Alibaba or are they going to buy from Amazon? When Africa needs cereal and underwear and socks and the developed world rises, uh, undeveloped world rises to be a developed world, what's going to happen? Now, does it really matter if it ends up being who the underwear is bought from? If it's Amazon or Alibaba, does it really matter? We don't know quite yet, but maybe it does matter. Maybe it is more important for um, the United States to have some sort of a, of a, of a more of a, of a geopolitical control over things. Maybe it's good for China to rise up and both work together in making sure that the earth prospers. Okay, so that's, you know, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that we touched on the Belt Road Initiative, what was going on in the world, um, kind of the... It's a small rock, you know? You know, take a look one more time at, at Earth here. And, you know, you're taking, a, taking one more look at what we have here on Earth. And, you know, this is a small rock. Like, if I go, if I go all the way to the north, okay, there, I'm pointed all the way north. You can sail around the Earth, and we've talked about this for a while. You can sail around the Earth in this 40, right here, this 40 to... Um, to 50 degree latitude area. You can sail around it just like this in 40 days. So if you can sail around the earth in 40 days, it's a pretty small place. It's important to figure out who's gonna geopolitically lead it and what that's gonna look like. Um, and like, let's figure out, cause this is covering 68 countries, 65% of the world's population, 40% uh, percent of the GDP right here. And that's the, those are big, big numbers. That's a lot of people, that's a lot of GDP, that's a lot of countries, and they're doing some very interesting things. And I'd love to, you know, one of my goals is to figure out how to work with China, how to make a United States-China partnership that fosters a really beautiful future civilization, um, where US and China can work together and make sure that we cover things like existential risk and make sure there's no AI race or arms race or, 
or uh, assault robots, uh, weapon, weapon robots, or um, weapons in biology. So if we can figure out how to work together with China um, and support them in the Belt and Road Initiative, and maybe the United States can start a Belt and Road Initiative to South America and to Africa and Europe and uh, Asia as well, we can make a better globalized uh, world moving forward that just works together and that does not get greedy or corrupt. So let's work on it. You know, meditation is, of course, a big part of that as well. Um, let's learn how to tune inward. <sighs> Thanks for tuning in about the Belt and Road Initiative. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, if you guys had a good time, continue supporting us by watching, commenting below, teach two people about this. Don't just consume, go create with this content, go and make cool videos, go and make amazing writings about this. We'd love to see that more um, and, and send it to us as well. Also, join us on Patreon so, so we can sustain this, grow this, impact more people with this, please. Um, we got some dope live events coming up in August. David Eagleman on August 3rd, very excited for that. Uh, and later on in the month as well. We're very pumped to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to Ron, our producer director. Much love, everyone. Peace.